right, everyone. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker this morning, who will also be speaking at noontime on a, on a slightly different subject, also for the researchers, so you're welcome to come back then. Uh, Dr. Claude Burgoyne, and you may wonder why am I, as a retina specialist, introducing a glaucoma a speaker, a glaucoma clinician scientist? Well, I know Claude because he and I are both on the board of trustees for ARVO, and um, we're very honored for the fact that he is the incoming, he's the president-elect of ARVO, so it's a good honor to have him here. A little bit of a brief background, he and I also share an upper Midwest uh, upbringing. He's from Wisconsin, but he did a lot, of his, a lot of his schooling at University of Minnesota, and he did, he of interest has an architecture degree, and then uh, eventually went to medical school at University of Minnesota, and your fellowship was at Hopkins, uh, Wilmer, uh, yeah. and uh, Harry yeah, with Harry Quigley, and eventually he did, uh, he was in, uh, on the faculty at LSU, and so knows, knows Dr. Hartnett from those times there. And, uh, but eventually he, uh, Hurricane Katrina forced him up to uh, a, a less, well, similarly, a different rainy place up in Oregon at the Devers Eye Institute. So I'm very pleased to introduce Claude here, who will be our speaker today. Thank you, Claude. Well, thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Emmy, for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. A um, uh, pleasure to talk about OCT imaging. And um, I do want to acknowledge that I work very closely with Heidelberg Engineering, um, but I receive no personal income from that relationship uh, and certainly have received no um, support for this talk. Um, I am also fortunate to be NIH funded uh, to address the very specific issues that. Um, I'll talk about today. This is my research lab at the Devers Eye Institute, um, who have directly or indirectly produced um, a lot of the data that I will show you. And uh, my group of collaborators at the Devers Eye Institute, we're an unusually close group, mostly focused on glaucoma. And Hung Lee Yang is a research scientist in my laboratory that has led a lot of these analyses. I've also been fortunate to be close friends and colleagues with Bal Shahan, and many of the ideas uh, that you'll see here are the result of um, our work together. So um, I always like to start um, by focusing on, on what cupping is. Um, in general, the objectives for this talk um, are that I'd like to explain the importance of Brooks membrane opening in your clinical disc examination. Um, I want to try to identify the difference uh, between OCT minimum rim width and clinical cup disc ratio. Um, and finally, I, I'm hoping to convince you of the importance of the foveal BMO axis and uh, in the phenotyping of retinal uh, anatomy. So what is glaucoma discupping? Um, I uh, like to put forward the controversial premise that it's connective tissue deformation and remodeling in the neuropathy of glaucoma that underlies the phenomenon of cupping, it what's, is what makes it unique, um, and that in order to really, for a clinician to look at a nerve head and feel comfortable calling it glaucoma, regardless of what the pressure is, it's the connective tissue phenomenon in the neuropathy that lead you to feel comfortable doing that. So while the retinal ganglion cell axons in the soma are, of course, central to vision loss and the disease, and ultimately they are what drive the neuropathy, um, it's the connective tissues that really make you feel comfortable. Um, and I'm going to try to convince you more of that. And if anybody can make my research lecture, that will really be uh, the very focus of the research lecture for the talk. But it, all of these things influence our view on phenotyping the neuropathy. Um, and so I have to start by making some of these points. So um, the optic uh, nerve head in glaucoma is a site, uh, a primary site, if not the primary site of insult to the visual system. It's by multiple mechanisms that occurs at all level of intraocular pressure. Um, and from our standpoint, um, uh, Paul alluded to my background in architecture. I had enough engineering to be able to talk comfortably and convince engineers to work with me on this project. And so my main grant is focused on the engineering of the optic nerve head tissues. It's a complex environment and challenging at all levels of intraocular pressure, which is why we have 
the optic neuropathy of glaucoma occurring so frequently at normal levels of pressure. So all optic neuropathies demonstrate some form of cupping. It's just that the non-IOP-related optic neuropathies usually demonstrate a very shallow form of cupping uh, that is prelaminar tissue thinning. It's not actually deformation of the underlying <coughs> connective tissues. Now this um, is taken from one of our articles, and what I'm showing you here is a cross-section through this optic nerve head. This is actually a, a digital section from a three-dimensional reconstruction of these tissues. Um, and it's demonstrating the difference between the cupping that occurs when the prelaminar tissues, which are shown here in purple, are thinned or lost, and that leads to a shallow form of cupping, as opposed to a deeper form of cupping that occurs when the connective tissues of the lamina deform and remodel out of the eye. And I'm going to talk a lot about that um, in this afternoon's um, research lecture. But the basic idea is that the tissues of the lamina carbosa fail uh, in a very predictable pattern and that in failing, they're also remodeling while they do this, the canal expands and the lamina thins and ends up being profoundly uh, deformed. Now having said those things, we all know that the phenotype of glaucoma is very variable. It can look many different ways, and this is just an extreme P patients from my practice who have very well documented long histories of elevated intraocular pressure and have a neuropathy that while it behaved in terms of its visual field changes uh, in a glaucomatous manner, if you were just to look at this nerve, it's a very shallow form of cupping as opposed to um, a myopic eye that also has elevated pressure and, has, and is showing a very profound and deep form of cupping. Now one thing that we know, one thing that contributes to the way an individual eye will look as it develops glaucoma is the underlying uh, stiffness of the connective tissues. That sort of intuitively makes sense um, at any given level of pressure or pressure elevation. An eye that has very stiff tissues is not going to have as deep of cupping as uh, an eye that has very compliant tissues, and on average, aged eyes, we know now from very good studies in monkeys and humans, have stiffer connective tissues in the sclera and the lamina, and so on average, aged eyes have a shallower form of cupping, and this, I won't go into details, it's just a study we did in monkeys to show that at different levels of retinal nerve fiber layer thinning, monkeys had, uh, young monkeys had deeper cupping than old monkeys on average. So um, this was our uh, ori original concept um, about how cupping occurs. And then as we began to study monkeys very early in the neuropathy, we were very uh, surprised to find two things. This is a an, uh, an, uh, control eye and an experimental glaucoma eye of an animal with very early damage, less than 10% axon loss. And you will see that the lamina is bowed back. That is, um, uh, we would expect. But the lamina is profoundly thickened rather than thinned, and it has migrated out of the sclera. Notice the control eye laminar insertion into the sclera where we would expect. Now the lamina has migrated into the pia. And so it's not just deformation, the lamina is remodeling. It's a very active process. We think of connective tissues deforming as a passive process, but that passive deformation then elicits a tremendous remodeling response. That's a very active process. And ultimately, in this afternoon's lecture, I'll talk more about the potential treatment opportunities that these two phenomena present. Here I'm showing you a series of uh, histomorphic digital sections from animals that span from very, very early in the neuropathy all the way through end stage. And you can see the remodeling process starting and how profoundly this has occurred with the lamina way into the peel insertion in the orbital optic nerve in an end stage eye. And these are very peripheral phenomenon. It's going on throughout the lamina, but much more so peripherally. And we think this underlies some of the classic phenomenon that explain the clinical behavior of glaucoma, including nerve fiber layer hemorrhages, acquired laminar pits, and the rim and nerve fiber layer loss that is peripheral more than central. So all of this is just to emphasize the importance of these connective tissue phenomena and lay the foundation for seeking to image them and detect them using OCT imaging. So let me move now into the OCT portion of the talk and, and explain why I use the word paradigm change 
uh, for the OCT future that we have in all retinal and optic nerve head diseases. And I start with Röntgen because I think this is the same equivalent analogy. A uh, hundred years ago, pulmonologists, general medicine doctors had to begin to deal with the fact that they could actually see anatomy beyond what they could hear or pound or touch and feel. And I think we're in the same position in um, uh, ophthalmology now, and part of the focus of this talk is to get people to move from just taking the paper printout and looking at the flat printout and start to integrate the actual anatomy into your clinical examination. And we're also pushing the imaging companies to make that easier for you to do. So let's start with the clinical disc examination and kind of review what we do now, which is basically not a lot different than uh, when Helmholtz first uh, uh, created our ability to see the back of the eye. Certainly, Armalee's introduction of cup disc ratio was a major advance in 1967, but in the year 2016, I'm going to argue with all due respect to his great accomplishments that this is simply no longer acceptable way to assess the anatomy of the optic nerve head. And I hope in the next 30 minutes that you'll agree with that. So let's start with the disc margin as a concept. We conceptualize the disc margin, wherever you put it, and we'll talk about that in a moment, to be an actual boundary of the neural tissues. And then we uh, suppose that a horizontal estimate, which is all we can do as a clinician, which is essentially in the plane of the retina, is an accurate assessment of the rim. And both of these are necessary delusions uh, if you want to clinically estimate the rim with, which I love the clinical examination. It is something that we will always do, but what OCT is allowing us to do is to recognize our extreme limitations in doing this. These are delusions because the disc margin is not a single structure. It's not usually a boundary of the neural tissues, believe it or not, and it's very variable. So the concept of the disc margin is inconsistently applied. No one teaches you where to mark the disc margin. And um, so let me show you some problems with this. First, this notion um, that there's no agreement on where the disc margin is. Now, this is from a 2003 textbook, uh, a neuro-ophthalmology textbook, and it, it hi highlights the disc margin in this fashion, and that would be my first question to everybody in the audience is, how many of you agree that this is the clinical disc margin? If you do, then I've marked it here in green. This would be your disc margin. This is where I would mark the disc margin, somewhat inner that. I would, I use the term the innermost hyperreflective border or boundary, and that's because I think that is the end of Bruch's membrane opening. So which one do you like? One or two? We'll go back and forth. And when I usually have people raise their hands, it's split about, it's about 50-50. So the fact of the matter is, actually let me go back. That's the disc margin, and we know that the rim margin is even much more variable th than that. So clinicians, if you train them, clinicians can become quite reproducible but they are very different from one another. And if you don't train them, they are all over the place. And let me show you a little data to support that. So this um, is a study that we performed at the Devers Eye Institute in our OCT, our uh, longitudinal NIH study of ocular hypertensive patients. And we asked the clinic, uh, clinicians, five glaucoma specialists, one of them was a fellow in training, uh, to do the following um, exercise. We had 214 eyes of 214 uh, um, high-risk patients, five glaucoma subspecialists, and we simply asked them to mark the disc margin and the rim margin in stereo photographs. So they started with high-resolution stereo photographs on a large high-resolution screen. We asked them to mark the disc margin first, and you can see um, that in this representative eye, that it bounces back and forth, some mark it here, some mark it at the edge of what I think is the RPE. Then we'd have them do the same for the rim margin. We have them both sets of points. We have the, their estimate of the rim, and you can see how variable they are in this eye, and I will say this is a very representative eye, and this um, is an example of five other eyes, and you can see the range of the size of the disc and the remaining rim width. These are the aspects of the clinical exam that are visible to you as a clinician. 
and I would argue that they're confusing, but what I'm going to try to convince you of next is that the most important anatomy has been invisible to you, and it's only now through OCT imaging that we've become aware of this. So this is just a representative OCT image of the anatomy uh, of the disc margin. Um, this is the RPE, the choroid, the sclera. Brooks membrane opening is the end of Brooks membrane, and there is some a great deal of variability in what are referred to as the border tissues of Elschnig. This is a schematic of that same anatomy. And what is underappreciated is that Brooks membrane can often extend beyond the border tissues to variable degree. It can have variable amounts of pigment on it. And what has emerged from our work and others is that this is highly unusual to be visible to the clinician when this occurs. It, com it commonly occurs regionally. This is work that uh, Val and I did over the past five years now, six years now, in which we co-localized photographs to the infrared image acquired at the time of OCT acquisition. The green lines represent radial B scans, and because this is done uh, with the spectralis uh, and they use eye tracking, um, we know quite precisely where every A scan is located, and these are now superimposed onto this clinical photograph. So we can really compare OCT anatomy to what we're seeing clinically. This um, is an important representative image. It's showing you uh, the red dots. I hope that you can see them. They're, they might be somewhat faint. If we could lower the lights a little bit more, that, that would be great. So hopefully you can see the red dots along the edge. I'm showing you the red dots. Um, and you can see one here at the end of Brooks' membrane, just at the important clinical clock hours. Here are all of the um, Brooks membrane opening points in 24 radio B scan uh, images in red. And this is where I would put the clinical disc margin. Now, it's a good time to pause for a moment and say, many of you, if you would put the disc, clinical disc margin here, you're probably at the edge of the RPE and much further away from the actual boundary of the neural tissues. So let's just touch on that point further. Here's where I would put the disc margin. Here is the vertical uh, A scan along which that point lies, and most likely it's the reflection of the end of Brooks membrane opening. That's very satisfying. Um, if you marked the disc margin here, you are that far away from the edge of the neural tissues and probably at the start of the RPE. So we did this for a large number of, of eyes in Halifax and it was very common. In fact, most of the eyes, there was at least one region in which Brutes membrane was well inside of uh, where the clinical disc margin was, and if you mark the disc margin here, you're even that much further away um, from the actual neural boundary. So this was the first point at which we realized OCT imaging was detecting things that clinicians could not see. Again, on the nasal side, there was a nice correlation between what we saw as the disc margin and the end of Brooks membrane. But on the temporal side, there was this suggestion that a large part of Brooks membrane opening um, extended beyond what we could see, and none of us could see anything here. That actually troubled me a great deal, because in monk we had done studies like this in monkeys, and while this occurred, it was never this common or that flagrant, and I just didn't believe this was true, so I actually flew to Halifax and had um, Val um, arrange for 15 of these study patients that had findings just like this to come into clinic over two days, and we examined all of them. I just assumed that if I got the light right, there would be something reflecting there and I'd be able to see the end of Brooks membrane opening, but it was absolutely not the case. That there was nothing visible in any of these patients. However, oops. However, we, in this patient, we noticed that we had a real opportunity because there was a cilial retinal artery that seemed to be coming up and around the end of Brooks membrane opening. And so we knew that if we could show that that was present in the images, we would prove to ourselves and others that Brooks membrane actually did extend to the notch in this vessel, um, but it was completely invisible. And so we brought that patient back the next day, and they agreed to have very high resolution B scans um, uh, starting outside of the disc margin. So this is the first one and you can see that Brooks membrane is intact, as is the sclera and the choroid. And I'm just going to march in now 
progressively. So we are past the point that any of us would put the disc margin. You can see that Bruch's membrane is intact, beautiful uh, underlying lamina in the buttress peripheral Bruch's membrane. It's really um, quite, quite, quite beautiful. And I'm just still coming in. You can see that Bruch's membrane is still intact. You can see the two parts of the vessels coming together and there's the notch in the vessel and now Bruch's membrane is no longer attacked. So essentially, we've proven in this eye, and there was one other eye in the study that had the same feature that we could also, we proved to ourselves that it wasn't a problem with the uh, alignment of the um, OCT acquisition. It was a very real finding. Okay, so the next issue is inaccurate um, measurement. Um, we know uh, if you start again with this point, clinicians have to estimate the rim within the plane of the, of the retina. You're just forced to do that. There's no way that you can do a minimum measurement, but wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be better if we could make a minimum measurement of the rim tissue like we do in the nerve fiber layer, like this? And that measurement has been now incorporated into um, most of the current OCT instruments for rim measurement. It's called minimum rim width or BMO minimum rim width. Uh, and when it's done three-dimensionally, it's been a uh, minimum rim area and it uh, attempts to make a, a cross-sectional estimate of the remaining rim tissue. This is not actually our idea. This was first described by Drexler's group in 2007 and in a series of previous articles. But once you commit to this much anatomy, then a whole bunch of interesting uh, implications occur very quickly to you. So if you're going to trust that OCT anatomy is accurate, and there certainly are still caveats to that, and trust that the clinical examination of that anatomy is not, then it pushes you towards some next steps in this process. And we outlined what these next steps should be in an editorial for AJO uh, magazine, and I'm going to sort of take you through um, some of these implications. So it's not that Bruch's membrane opening is the only anatomic boundary of the rim tissue. It just happens to be that it's very well visualized within OCT imaging, and it's, um, uh, it, it is a consistent anatomic boundary. So, what happens next is if you realize that, first of all, if you have eye tracking and so you can really control where the imaging is being done, if in every patient, when you first image the patient, you can acquire um, a, an optic nerve head data set that finds Bruch's membrane opening and then you can move over and find the fovea real time in OCT imaging, establish the axis between the fovea and Bruch's membrane, op uh, Bruch's membrane opening, which organizes the retinal nerve fiber layer between these two structures. Um, then you can acquire all forms of uh, OCT imaging, including those in the macula relative to this access, and perhaps have more consistency. So here I'm illustrating the concept we currently have, which is you take an image of the back of the eye. It has some boundary on it, which I'm going to call the acquired image frame. And we say this is the superior an inferior pole of the nerve head. But there is absolutely no anatomic justification for calling this the superior optic disc. It changes on a given day in a given patient depending upon the position of their head and the cyclotorsion that's present, and it changes among human eyes very dramatically. So if we would use the access between the fovea and Bruch's membrane opening consistently, would this reduce some of the visit, uh, variability in our normative databases? And again, the work that shows that the retinal nerve fiber layer is organized relative to the access between uh, Bruch's membrane opening and the fovea is done um, over the last 20 years in a series of very impressive studies. So at this point in time, it's a theory. We have to show, we had to build the tools to be able to explore the hypothesis that this will improve our normative databases and allow for better discrimination. This is a, a, a study that we published just showing the range um, of the foveal BMO access um, uh, in an, uh, our group of uh, 
250 or 227 P3 patients, you can see it ranges from minus 16 degree to um, actually uh, as much as plus one to plus two degrees. So every eye is different. We know this that in, on average, the fovea is beneath the horizontal midline, which we refer to as the rafe, but the, the rafe is actually following the foveal BMO axis, at least between the disc and the fovea. Okay, so the first notion was to build the capability of doing this, um, and we now have that on the spectralis instrument. Other instrument manufacturers, um, I think, are considering this approach. Um, and they are doing some forms of regionalization that are comparable to it. Um, and now, having built that ability, I want to talk about what our plans are for um, actually uh, phenotyping in this way. So um, we um, will acquire normative databases um, in, this, in this manner, and I'll talk about that in a moment, um, relative to the foveal BMO access. The optic nerve head will be regionalized relative to the foveal BMO axis in all of the eyes, and clinicians will be presented with, for example, rim width anatomy on a clock hour basis. If they wish, they can load a stereo photo or a photograph into the software. It will co-localize it to um, the OCT IR image and show the clinician exactly this image so that not only can you see the anatomy, in, in this case, the rim anatomy at every clock hour, but it will be color coded um, as to whether it's normal, borderline, or abnormal relative to the normative databases. And the same thing can be done for rates of change when we have that data. How is that uh, arrow chosen? Sometimes it's almost vertical, sometimes it's almost horizontal. So th thank you for asking that question. It is the minimum distance. So once Brooks, membra once Brooks membrane opening has been determined and the internal limiting membrane has been uh, found and delineated and both of those things are now fully automated, most of the instrument manufacturers are capable of that and, and while there are caveats on its accuracy, the more myopic the eye is, the more difficult the anatomy is, uh, the more failures there are in the algorithm, but it, it's, it's remarkably good, I think. It's, uh, defensively good to start. Then the algorithm looks for the shortest distance between the internal limiting membrane and Brooks membrane opening. And 95 or 96 percent of the time that occurs in one location and then there's potential for it to be in multiple locations and the algorithm can become confused. But, but that's the concept. So the idea is you're measuring the rim in a way that's similar to the nerve fiber layer, which, which is a minimum thickness measurement. Okay, here's some expanded um, notions which are, we are, uh, are working towards using uh, both normative databases and two large groups of glaucoma patients. So it will be um, um, assessments of the rim that have not just rim, minimum rim width but prelaminar tissue thickness uh, as well as various forms of rim volume measurements. Um, this allows us um, to um, uh, report minimum rim width um, in sectoral distributions, and you, we can report change over time in sectoral um, distributions. Um, deeper in the nerve head, uh, we uh, are, I, I will t talk in a minute about um, our delineations of the first normative database, but parameters such as anterior lamina curvosa surface depth relative to Brooks membrane opening reference plane, that is currently sort of the standard uh, is Brooks membrane opening reference plane that will change and, and move into the peripheral sclera. Um, torsion of the nerve head, um, which um, is currently done using the clinical disc margin. Um, you'll see in a moment that that concept will expand as more of this anatomy becomes available to us. And the amount that the long axis of Brooks membrane opening um, is, varies from the BMO vertical, the vertical axis relative to the foveal BMO um, horizontal axis um, can be quantified. This is sort of the current um, strategy for talking about how torted a disc is, um, how turned it is. And let me just say, one of the reasons that we think it's important to quantify all of this anatomy is we think ultimately this influences the distribution of rim tissue in normal patients. In other words, 
patients who have a normal amount of rim but have a, a, a certain amount of torsion, the distribution will be different and we'll be able to correct the normative databases to better evaluate, say, myopic patients. And that's um, ultimately the long-term goal. So this is done on the, on the disc margin. This is done on Brooks membrane opening, which is obviously much different than that. If you begin to put these anatomies together, these are now Brooks membrane opening points delineated in three-dimensional space. This is the anterior scleral canal opening. And you can see that the phenomenon of tilt and torsion are really having to do with the relationship of Brooks membrane opening to the anterior scleral canal opening. And if you further turn those in space, you can get to what is the actual minimum uh, cross-sectional area that the neural tissues pass through, which is a much more complicated geometry than when you look at it clinically. And this gets us to the question of size of the disc. In glaucoma and, and broadly, we know that some, the size of the disc has something to do with the risk of developing glaucoma. We think bigger discs are more susceptible, um, and, but bigger discs may also have more neural tissues because there's more room for the neurons that are struggling to survive and axons to survive, and we haven't been able to sort these things out. From a biomechanical standpoint, we know that the, ant the sclera is hugely influential and in the anterior scleral canal opening is probably the thing that, that determines susceptibility to intraocular pressure, whereas the neural canal minimum opening probably is what influences the number of axons that are in a given optic nerve head with, again, many caveats. And so we can separate these two things now. Now separate from this, there will be sort of the standard retinal uh, multilayer segmentation algorithms that already, already exist. But we're hoping that by doing this relative to the foveal BMO access, we will be able to provide a standardization to our retinal colleagues, for example, that will allow them more robust uh, ability to detect smaller different treatment differences um, than what they're capable of doing now. Now, again, that's a hypothesis that has to be tested. One of the very interesting things is that, as it turns out, if you do very high resolution scans peripheral to the fovea, so temporal to the fovea, the RAFE can be identified by looking at the retinal nerve fiber layer pattern, and it does not seem to follow the foveal BMO axis temporal to the fovea. It is very variable. It tends to be more uh, uh, towards the horizontal, sort of the, uh, the position of, the, of where the eye sits horizontally. Um, this is brand new. It's uh, in, in development. And, but it will influence the distribution of the rim tissue. And I think it are, it's these relationships that explain the isn't ruling glaucoma, the fact that a normal eye should have the greatest amount of rim tissue inferiorly, then superiorly, then nasally and temporally. The, that rule reflects these relationships, the, the, the most common form of these relationships. And if we can tease them out, we're hoping that we'll better be able to establish normative values for a given eye. So combining all of these different aspects of optic nerve head and retinal anatomy will allow us to better predict how much rim tissue is present. And again, that's a working hypothesis. OK, what are some of the clinical um, implications of this? First is I'm hoping that we are going to be able to show that by acquiring data in this way, our normative values will be tighter and therefore we'll better be able to discriminate early forms of structural glaucoma. So for the Spectralis database, um, we have completed a, a mixed American um, normative database that's 378 um, patients, it's Caucasians, that actually um, portions of those were um, also were acquired in Europe, but they met the FDA um, guidelines for meeting the census distribution of ethnicity. Um, a Japanese normative database has been acquired. The expansion of the Hispanic descent portion of the mixed ethnicity normative database to a full 250 subjects is underway, as is the African descent portion. That's all work that's being done now. Uh, the Chinese normative database is being planned. 
um, the Continental Indian Normative Database. And something I'm very excited about is the concept of an extended biometry normative database. In other words, imaging, all, of course, normative databases are generally limited to minus three plus three, uh, refractive error. Um, our intention is to image eyes of all axial lengths, sh short to long, and then ask the question, do they have visual field loss or not? Uh, and begin to sort out at what point, what form of myopia, myopic change is likely to be accompanied by field loss. So I'm just going to talk for a moment about the American um, mixed normative database. The rim values for the Caucasian portion of this have already been described by Bell uh, in uh, 2015. So that the, the Caucasian part of the database um, has uh, been described. And we have just completed manual delineation of 378 eyes of 378 uh, patients of the deep optic nerve head, and this is all of the structures in the deep optic nerve head. This is part of our uh, NIH funding um, to do this, uh, and we, I hope, will have our Arvo abstracts this year um, characterizing the relationship of laminar depth and la features of the peripapillary sclera and the anterior scleral canal opening. So we do have evidence that um, using minimum rim width improves detection in glaucoma. I'm showing you one study, again by Bal Shahan, that um, compared minimum rim width to a horizontal rim width measurement. This is in OCT imaging, and instead of taking the minimum that we just talked about, they, we tried to mimic the clinician by doing a horizontal measurement in the plane of Bruch's membrane opening, sort of to mimic that, and then compared that to the older form of HRT um, assessment uh, of rim width and retinal nerve fiber layer thickness, and at a specificity of 95 percent, this achieved a sensitivity of 82 percent, which was significantly higher. Uh, this is the minimum rim measurement compared to horizontal and to retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. Now, there are two other studies that have replicated this, um, and there's a third study that didn't find a significant difference between retinal nerve fiber layer and MRW, but they both behaved at a higher, at the highest level that the MRW had previously achieved. So um, that's going to be, continue to be sorted out by a number of groups. Um, it should be the case, not that this is hugely important clinically, but it bothers me and a lot of people. Why doesn't the correlation between the rim and the nerve fiber layer, why isn't it better? Uh, and, and then one step further than that, why isn't structure versus function correlation better? And there's a lot of explanations for this, but um, measuring rim in this fashion and measuring retinal nerve fiber layer thickness in a minimum fashion was one way in which there was no reason to expect that they would closely correlate because you're measuring them in a different way. Now, when you measure rim in this way and nerve fiber layer in the same manner in a different lo location, the structure, structure correlation improves substantially. But remember, the composition of the nerve fiber layer, the astrocyte and vascular composition of the nerve fiber layer is different than the, minim than, than the rim. The rim is the rim. It's not the nerve fiber layer now measured in a different location. Rim tissue is different. It includes the nerve fiber layer. And so there's a lot of implications from that statement, which I can't, I can't go into uh, in this talk, but we can talk more about if, if you have questions. So in the same light, if we make this kind a, of rim measurement compared to this kind of rim measurement and compare it um, to correlations with visual field testing, my colleague Stuart Gardner did this again in, in our group of uh, P3 patients, Portland Progression Project patients, and showed improved um, structure function correlations measuring the rim in this way. The retinal nerve fiber layer still correlated better than the rim tissue. And again, I have some answers for why that might be true. So change detection um, is still early in all of OCT imaging. In monkeys, we have done um, a very rigorous study in eight animals, following them with all forms of uh, OCT, HRT, uh, scanning laser polarimetry, and electro, uh, electroretinogram testing, every two week testing, um, that um, very, very clearly showed that we could measure deep structural change, deformation of the lamina in these animals well before we were able to detect any other form of structural change. 
um, and functional change. And there's a lot of caveats to that statement, but there is um, now one or two studies that, is begin that are beginning to compare rim to nerve fiber layer uh, changes in humans, but there's not a definitive study yet on this issue. And I'll just, well, this is a good place to make this point. So, I showed you this side before, and I told you that in our monkeys, on average, for a given amount of nerve fiber layer change, the, monkey, the young monkeys had deeper cupping. We could detect lam laminar deformation earlier in those animals, or deformation of structural change, in part because the lamina was deforming more, we, we assumed, because it's on average more compliant in those tissues. And in older eyes, we had to wait until there was rim thinning because the lamina didn't deform as much. So this has implications for clinical structure function correlation. It might be an, the advantage that an eye that is compliant will deform more for a given amount of IOP elevation and it will be easier to detect that deformation at a point at which more axons are still viable. Um, and it will also potentially influence the relationship to visual field loss. So I just mentioned these notions. I'm not going to go into them now, but really an individual patient's compliance of their connective tissues is going to influence how easy it is to detect longitudinal structural change in that patient. And I, I, I won't go into that. This actually, interestingly, has been demonstrated in a longitudinal study by Chris Long in Hong Kong in which older patients demonstrated more retinal nerve fiber layer thinning for progression <coughs> than optic nerve head rim change for progression. So the idea here was to how did an individual patient progress? Was it nerve fiber layer thinning or was it rim change? And in this study, the older patients demonstrated much more nerve fiber layer thinning than change in the rim. They don't directly correlate even when, even when you, axons are lost um, and, and uh, are detected in the nerve fiber layer. So um, overall, I started out by talking about glaucomatous cupping and I emphasized the connective tissue component to it because I'm hopeful that as OCT imaging uh, uh, advances and as segmentation of OCT imaging follows our and others' manual delineation um, that you will see more and more use of the deep optic nerve head anatomy to detect glaucoma and detect progression. Um, I don't have time to put in all of the work that's being done on laminar imaging, but I'm sure that whether you're in glaucoma or not, you, are, you have seen the papers on laminar pits and laminar insertion defects. Um, and uh, this, these are exciting developments. We and others have to do a lot of work to convince people that the OCT is capable of actually seeing the back of the lamina. That's not consistently done. Um, and we are working to provide histomorphometric confirmation of this. I've talked about um, a paradigm change. Let me go back. Um, and called it that because I really do think it is the point at which you all are going to need to look at the anatomy at the same time you're looking at the quantification of the anatomy, and that means the instrument manufacturers have to make it easier for you to see the anatomy, and I hope the feedback will be it will improve your examination. You, it, your examination will start to be more satisfying. Things that didn't previously make sense, like somebody that appeared to have a lot of rim tissue, and they had, yet they had a field defect or nerve fiber layer thinning, and it didn't, how could they have that much rim and have this, this focal rim uh, nerve fiber layer loss and defect. And I hope that having OCT anatomy will Im improve your ability to detect that. Um, hopefully, um, the phenotyping approach that we're taking to the, um, to the macula will um, add power to uh, retinal studies and, and, and uh, uh, all of the retinal physicians who will be using this imaging. Um, and I've gone through some of the clinical implications. So um, I hope you understand at least um, uh, our contentions about Brooks membrane opening, um, how it's different from the clinical dysmargin, 
Um, I hope that you um, appreciate the minimum rim measurement. I, all of the instruments are now doing this, as I've said, and I think it's going to become a common output in addition to retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. Um, and the issue of how important it is to regionalize relative to the foveal BMO access um, is uh, up in the air. It's a hypothesis. It's a working hypothesis. And for me, the exciting thing is we have the technology now to, to truly implement it and assess how important it is to do things in this manner. So with that, um, I will um, again leave you with Renkin and uh, the suggestion that we're all going to need to integrate this anatomy uh, into our clinical examinations. And thank you very much for your attention. Do we have questions? So if we have a spectralis. Turn the lights on. Oh, yes. Turn the lights on. If we have a spectralis now, do we automatically get software upgrades with the latest stuff? Or yeah. yeah. Yes. So the answer is yes. Um, if, you, do you, if you have the newest uh, uh, spectralis for OCT angiography, then um, you have that software already. It's already there. You may not be aware of it. Um, if you have an old, uh, the, the previous version that doesn't, have, that doesn't have the upgrade for OCT and geography, you can still fully employ this acquisition software, visualization software, and quantification software to do this. So the new um, instrument, that, uh, the new Spectralis, um, has a different spectrometer. It has a deeper penetration to it. Um, and it is much faster. Um, so that was all necessary for the angiography part. Actually, the speed is what was necessary for the angiography part. But you can do everything that I showed you with the previous version of the Spectralis, um, and it has a full complement of the software um, necessary to see this. Yeah. Any? Claude, that was really terrific. I'm thinking like uh, with the minimal rim that you're, that you're measuring, and as you said, there's, there are many other cell types within that. So if you had, say, an ischemic event or an inflammatory event, you may have other processes occurring there. Do you think the OCT will be able to uh, distinguish, say, edema or inflammatory cells or anything like that within the rim tissue? Be because I would think that we'd get bigger, right. potentially, and kind of mess up some of the thinking. So um, the first pass at that is, um, yes, there are people who, um, in fact, uh, Drexler's group and other, who are working to get towards cellular explanations for OCT phenomenon. And that may help us in, in the rim, and actually, the very final part of my research talk this afternoon, we are funded to very precisely co-localize uh, post-mortem immunohistochemistry to OCT data sets acquired on the day of sacrifice, and then knowing um, in a very robust way how protein expression has changed in that section of immunohistochemistry, go back and start with the post with the sacrifice day OCT image, and because of Heidelberg's eye tracking, take the same um, OCT section all the way through and try, seek the ability to correlate structural change in OCT to protein expression change. It's a big leap, but I, um, we're waiting to hear whether my grant's gonna be renewed or not, but that's, and I'll show some slides on that. So that, that's, that's part of the notion. Whether we'll be able to do that clinically is a, is a separate issue. Um, I'll also, I, I, I actually, I won't show it, but one of the very interesting things um, that emerges from this is as you actually begin to look at this. So when the rim is measured in this manner, and unfortunately, I don't have a slide in this talk. I'd have to dig for five minutes to get a slide to show you this. But it's not uncommon that the outer retina extends beyond Bruch's membrane in certain configurations. And so it, it's a bit hard to explain this, but if I showed you an image, you, you know exactly what I was talking about. The outer retina can extend well beyond Bruch's membrane opening. It comes back and, and relates to, to um, 
uh, to Brooks membrane opening, but extends out beyond it. And the minimum rim measurement, therefore, includes a large chunk of outer retina. It's one of the ways in which the rim tissue is different. It has a different composition than the nerve fiber layer. We shouldn't expect them to be the same. And it actually creates added benefit by rim change representing things that aren't axons. And therefore, if you detect a structural change, you have the ability to detect that the tissues are changing, but the axons aren't yet involved. And that's what we're hoping will be the case, that we'll, we'll get structural glaucoma that truly exceeds normative databases or represents a change. It's structural, but it doesn't. It's well before enough axons are um, involved to manifest as field loss. And of course, everybody, we, we call it now pre-parametric glaucoma. And we have definitions for why we think we can get to the point where it, it, it makes no difference whether the field changed or not. It's stru the structures are changing and you believe it. You, 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 and you believe the implications of that. The, the follow-up studies that then show that that kind of structural change leads to increased risk for field progression in five or 10 years have to be done. But that's, that's where the field is going. And again, what's exciting to me is that the infrastructures, we have the infrastructure now to do these studies. And, I hope that, yeah. No. You referred to OCT angiography. Can the single element imaging test would be to incorporate that along with your anatomical data, the capillary density, that sort of thing, that's certainly part of glaucoma. Yes. Perfusion. Yes. Uh, and there, th so um, we, we are um, doing that. Um, it's not our primary focus in the lab um, at the moment, um, but I, I believe that that is true. Um, for me, um, the capillary bed within the lamina and the posterior ciliary arteries coming through the peripapillary sclera, I think, is where the vascular component of glaucoma occurs primarily. And the rim tissue capillary changes, which are real and important, I think follow from these earlier alterations. Um, and we can't yet, the, even with our current state-of-the-art OCT angiography. It's not getting deep to the, into the laminar capillaries, and it's also not getting to the posterior ciliary arteries as they come through the sclera. And I'm hopeful that we'll get to that point. But there's at least two or three groups that are now NIH-funded. Uh, they have lo to, to look at OCT angiography changes in the rim compared to structural changes in the rim compared to nerve fiber layer change. And I think we will have some answers within the next five years um, uh, about how much additional information we get from capillary change. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you very much, Claude. Great. Thanks. Thanks.